God bless you, everybody. Great to be able to share the word of the Lord with you this evening. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to come over with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians 10. And uh, while you're headed there, just a few calendar things for you. We do want to encourage you, jump into the adult classes that are starting this week. Family Life Nights in full swing, as you heard. And you can still sign up for classes online or at the Welcome Center. There's also a flyer in your program this evening that you can use that'll help you sign up for classes. And if you didn't get a chance to drop that in the offering. You can still fill it out. You can drop that in one of the offering boxes that's in the lobby. Please remember that the uh, Genesis Bible Study has moved to Sacred Heart School on King Street, and uh, you can call us if you need directions. The following week, on Monday the 14th, we're very excited to launch a new ministry. It's called Divorce Care. Uh, Divorce Care is a ministry that's designed to help not only adults, but also teenagers and children who are dealing with separation and divorce. You can get more info on that on the website as well and I, I think there's also something about it in your program today want to let you know that the Jewish holidays are coming up. The Feasts of the Lord and Messiah's House is going to be holding special services for Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and the Feast of Tabernacles. These are going to be powerful times to gather for worship and hear about God's plan for his people as prophesied through his feasts. So look at your program for dates and times. The first one is a Rosh Hashanah service next Sunday evening. Our friend Grant Berry is going to be sharing on what's happening prophetically in the nations of the world. Uh, there's also initiative an initiative happening in churches all across Connecticut to use the Jewish feasts as a time to seek God in prayer and in repentance. And Harvest Time is going to be participating with other area churches in a special service on Friday the 18th. That's going to be our Fire in the Night service. But as a part of that, we're also inviting churches from around our region to join with us in worship and in prayer. And finally, one more thing. We're very excited to let you know that we are getting ready now to have you place scriptures inside the foundation of our phase two sanctuary. So we've been talking about it for a while and it's finally time now to make it happen. Uh, I think you know that the walls have started going up and uh, next weekend we're going to be distributing to you the materials that we're going to be using. Uh, the week after that on the 19th and 20th we're going to be dismissing our services a little early so that we can take our vials, little vials containing scriptures outside and then sometime after that the workers are going to be making what you've shared a part of the very foundation of phase two. So we're going to be sharing uh, more details with you about that in next weekend services. Please keep phase two uh, in your prayers. It's exciting to see it uh, coming together and coming up. We're, we're looking forward to the whole being a former whole. Amen? Amen. All right. Uh, let's look together at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. Paul says, Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who am in presence am lowly among you, but being absent am bold toward you. But I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some, who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapon of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Powerful words about the spiritual battles we engage in as Christian believers. And I want to share with you today on this topic, pulling down strongholds, pulling down strongholds. Let's pray and invite the Lord to come and minister as we look into his word this evening. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. It is truly a lamp for our feet, and it is the light for our pathway. Jesus said that the word of God is like seed. So we ask you, Lord, that our hearts might be good soil in this time, Lord. Soil that can receive and retain and bear fruit from the seed of the word of God. Jesus, you said that the words you speak to us are spirit and they are life. So we invite the Holy Spirit now to come and minister life to us from your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
And amen. Well, we've been moving through Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, and last week, Pastor Glenn shared a great word on the grace of giving. So be sure you get a copy of that message if you missed it. And we're moving into chapter 10 now, and as we've seen all the way throughout this letter from heaven, Paul has a deep concern for the spiritual health of the Corinthian church. Nowadays, I think we would say the Corinthian church was a church that had issues. And specifically, there were believers in the church who did not receive Paul's ministry, and they looked down on him. They looked down on his ministry. They even attacked his appearance and his speech. And as we read, some even thought he was walking according to the flesh. In this passage, Paul warns those who are living contrary to the gospel. And at the same time, he is giving us some tremendous insights into spiritual warfare. I see four truths here about spiritual warfare and I want to share them with you. Four important truths about spiritual warfare from 2 Corinthians 10. And the first one is this. God has shown us the true foundation for spiritual warfare. God has shown us the true foundation for spiritual warfare. Here in chapter 10, Paul shows the church the most essential principle of spiritual warfare. Church, I want to tell you this evening that spiritual success does not come from having an anointing. No amens, but that's okay. We'll figure it out. We don't necessarily win spiritual victories because we can see demons or even because we have a great knowledge of the Bible. Although having a good knowledge of the Bible is a good idea. Amen. amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, make sure you read your Bible this week. <laughs> No, Paul teaches us here that spiritual warfare isn't launched from the platform of power. It's launched from a foundation of humility and meekness. Paul walked in humility when dealing with his critics, and we need to do the same. Church, I want you to understand that there will always be critics. Imagine if you were the Apostle Paul and you wrote a quarter of the New Testament and yet people are running around saying he's not very impressive. <laughs> Critics will always be with us. So purpose in your heart that you will not let critics discourage you or knock you off track. Margaret Thatcher, the former British Prime Minister, said this about critics. If my critics saw me walking across the river, they would say it was because I didn't know how to swim. <laughs> there is no pleasing a critical spirit. And even Paul was not immune from having critics. On an earlier occasion, Paul had written to the Corinthians about their attitudes. And some people did actually repent. But not everybody did. And we'll see that chapter 10 is a major turning point in this letter. Paul will now begin to defend his ministry more strongly against his opponents. The question we need to ask is this, how did Paul defend himself? In verses 1 and 2, we see that Paul is pleading not to have to be bold when he arrives. Brothers and sisters, that is is the way of Christ and it must also be the way of those who follow him. God would rather show us mercy than move against us in judgment. Paul says, I Paul am pleading myself with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. In presence I'm lowly among you but being absent I'm bold towards you. He says, but I beg you that when I'm present I don't have to be bold with you by that boldness that I intend to use against some people. Paul's opponents were still thinking like pagans and not like Christians. You see, in Greek society, noble people were not supposed to be meek. It was beneath them. In the pagan world, humility was below the dignity of important people. Remember what Jesus said. He said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. But notice, by contrast, how Paul appeals to the saints. 
Rather than pulling rank, rather than reminding everyone who he is and what he's done and that he has a personal commission from Jesus, he pleads with them by the meekness and the gentleness of Christ. Paul is trying to convey to them that Christ is our example and we must look to his example more than looking to society to guide us about how we should do things or treat people. By humbling himself to become incarnate and humbling himself upon the cross, Jesus showed us that God's kingdom is about service. It's about kindness and gentleness. You see, prideful men despise those things. But once we begin to follow Jesus, we start to learn that humility does not make us weak. Just as Jesus wasn't weak when he modeled humility with a towel or on a cross. We sang about it today. Jesus is both the lion and the lamb. Refusing to boast about his position didn't make Paul weak. The meek and lowly Paul carried the power of the meek and lowly Jesus, but he wouldn't boast about it. Yes, he might be walking around in weak human flesh, but he wasn't waging war according to the flesh. He was waging war in the spirit. In fact, and church, we need to understand this, it's actually the meekness of Paul that allowed God to entrust him with great spiritual authority, and he used it to tear down spiritual strongholds of every kind. This isn't really so much of a passage about demonic strongholds as it is in context, Paul telling the Corinthians that he has power to tear down strongholds of disunity that are harming the church. And as somebody once said, that's good preaching. <laughs> but what is the spiritual warfare that God is calling us to? Spiritual warfare takes place when we come to set people free from spiritual enemies. We encounter spiritual resistance. We encounter pushback when we are fighting enemies that are more than flesh and blood. And when we try to liberate people from bondage to them. Many times we wage spiritual warfare against strongholds of thinking. Mindsets that trap people in destructive lifestyles. We'll have more to say about that in a few moments. But let us be clear that the foundation of all successful prayer and spiritual warfare is a heart of meekness and humility. Amen. Contrary to what the Corinthians believed, spiritual warfare and ministry success is not for those with great gifting and great eloquence. It's not for those who, like Paul, as they criticized him, Paul couldn't make a flashy appearance, and in their carnal minds that disqualified him from being great. Spiritual warfare is for those who have given up on self-promotion. It's for those who are motivated by a heart desire to see people escape from a life of sin and bondage. The true foundation for warfare is to possess the meekness of Christ. Do you want to see breakthrough for yourself and for your loved ones? Then we need to make sure that the soil of our hearts stays wholesome or else everything will have been for naught. Church, let's realize that our primary defense against the devil isn't tongues or fasting or some spiritual manifestation. It's Christ-likeness. Jesus said, the prince of this world, meaning the enemy, the prince of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. Wouldn't it be wonderful if when the devil came to my door, he found nothing inside me that he could use? Being like Christ is the key. Friends, if you win the argument, but become more like the devil in the process, you lost. So Paul says in Colossians 3, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also 
must do. Four truths about spiritual warfare. The first is that God has shown us what is the true foundation for spiritual warfare. The second is this. God has given us divinely powerful weapons. God has given us divinely powerful weapons. Christ-likeness is the foundation, but when our hearts are right, the weapons God gives us are divinely powerful. They release heaven's might into my troubled life. In verses 3 and 4, Paul says, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not make war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. Amen. Church, let's build our faith again by remembering the words of Jesus. How Jesus said, All power has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Let's remember that God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Let's remember that our weapons are mighty and that they release the power of God. Paul says we don't war according to the flesh. Nevertheless, Christians fail by trying to do exactly that. Make war, make warfare according to the flesh. How does this happen? Sometimes we fight with selfish motives. But this only leads to frustration. Remember, James said the wrath of man, all of man's pushing and striving, does not bring about the righteousness of God. Sometimes we tackle problems with man's wisdom, and that's also a mistake. We pray for others at times, or we counsel them according to our understanding of the problem, rather than bringing the word of God to bear on the situation, rather than seeking God's wisdom. What a shame when you and I can see so little and God can see so much. We often look to technology as a solution, right? We've cured diseases and we've been to the moon. So shouldn't we use science to fix people's lives? But church, I want to tell you, no scientific formula can break the chains of someone who's trapped by drugs or alcohol. No piece of software ever brought a broken family back together. There is no app for that. But thank God, the love of God can do it. Amen. Thank God the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. One touch from Jesus Christ far surpasses every treatment man can devise to try to heal a sick body or a wounded spirit. Jesus said, all power has been given to me in heaven and in earth. And that power is still released today when you use your mighty weapons of war. Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Church, it's time for us to get reacquainted with our heavenly arsenal. God is giving you weapons of war. Learn what they are and learn how to use them. Become a skillful warrior of Jesus Christ. You have the love of God, the power of a Christ-like character available to you. You have the wisdom of God because you have access to the mind of Christ. You have the gifts of the Holy Spirit available to you, the power of God that performs creative miracles. I'm going to get happy even if you don't. It's okay. <laughs> you have the power of prayer because you have access to the throne of God. Your prayer and your fasting can shake entire nations with the power of God. You can pray in a heavenly language that releases revelation from heaven down into your spirit. Mysteries that no devil can decipher. You have the armor of God. God has given you the shield of faith that quenches all the fiery darts of Satan. You have the name of Jesus, the name that makes demons flee and releases the authority of the living Christ to cure diseases and rule over nature. You have the word of God, the word that God says he magnified even above his name. It's alive and powerful and it's full of great and precious promises to empower your faith. You have the weapon of praise and worship. A song that gives you strength and creates confusion in the enemy's camp. I don't know about you, but when I have a problem, I have found that it's better to shout than to pout. <laughs> and you possess the beautiful presence of Christ. 
always with you, never leaving you, never forsaking you. It's that sweet presence that destroys the yoke. Do you have a yoke that needs breaking tonight? Maybe somebody you care about needs to be set free from a yoke today. It's the anointing that destroys the yoke and you possess the anointing to do it. You've got his presence and all of those other wonderful weapons of war. I only listed 10 weapons for you. You can probably find a few more in your Bible. Important truths about spiritual warfare. First, God has shown us the foundation for warfare. And second, God has given us some powerful weapons. The third truth that we find in Paul's words is this. God has made us his divinely appointed people. He's made us his divinely appointed people. Wow, look at those screens. I hope they don't ever put my face on that screen. My goodness. <laughs> Church, we have been divinely authorized. God has made you and me to be his warriors. One person believed that, I think. We've been commissioned to use God's weapons to obtain breakthrough for ourselves and for others. Paul says these are the weapons of our warfare. You see, Jesus has done his part. Jesus said, be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. Jesus did his part. He overcame the world. But while we are still in the world, we are learning to contend with the things that are exalting themselves against the knowledge of God. The things that are trying to take the place of God in people's lives. While we sometimes wish it weren't so, the weapons that God gives us are weapons of our warfare. We are called to warfare. I want you to say that. Say, I am called to warfare. You have a battle to wage and so do I. Every person, every believer has a battle that is uniquely theirs. So you have a battle to wage, but God has given you weapons of war and with his help, you will be equal to the challenge. Hallelujah. Jesus did his part and now he leads us and guides us as we do our part. We've become his ambassadors and he's called us to show people the difference that his gospel can make. Jesus never said, you won't find it. Jesus never said, behold, I make everything easy for my people. <laughs> But Jesus did say, he that believes in me, the works that I do shall he do also. God appointed us to display the power of the Son to the world. Just like Jesus, you've been appointed to do some works of power and to pull down some strongholds in people's lives. And that's good news. Jesus said, in my name, they shall lay hands on the sick. In my name, they shall cast out demons. We're a divinely appointed people with a commission from heaven to reach our communities. Sometimes people get nervous at that. They say, well, you know, I'm not really comfortable when you start talking about warfare, the idea of spiritual warfare. Well, to be honest with you, it really doesn't matter whether we're comfortable with that concept or not. I want to tell you, church, in case you didn't figure it out yet, the devil hates you either way. And so we're in a fight whether we like it or not. The Bible says the devil is going around with a roaring lion seeking somebody whom he may devour. Now, when you get home, you can take a razor blade and cut that verse out, but it won't change the matter. And that being the case, we need to rise up in prayer again for our families, for our communities. We need to contend in prayer for lost souls, for a lost society that has its fingers in its ears, that is unwilling to hear the word of the Lord. Why did God arrange things these, this way so that we would face opposition? I believe the Bible is clear. He set it up this way because he wants us to grow in our faith. He wants us to grow in the knowledge of him. And the only way that we can do that, unfortunately for my flesh, is by going through some things. That's the way, the only way that we can learn that God is faithful. 
That's the only way that we can experience his grace and power. It doesn't always feel good, obviously, but one of the most valuable things that you and I can experience is the trial of our faith. The Bible says it's more precious than gold. God doesn't want his children to be over cushioned. He wants us to be overcomers. And the only way that we can learn to be overcomers is if we have to overcome something, and that's good preaching too. Don't be afraid of the fact that you are engaged in warfare today. You may feel today, you may have come in here, and you may feel that you're fighting for your very life. But God has led you to this moment so that you can overcome. You can bring the victory of God into your situation using your divinely powerful weapons. Stand fast in faith and see the salvation of God. Amen. Paul says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise there. Four truths about spiritual warfare. God has shown us the foundation for warfare. He's given us divinely powerful weapons. He's made us a divinely appointed people. And finally this, God will make us victorious in our warfare. Amen. Church, I believe God will help us overcome both for others and for ourselves. How will he do it? God will supernaturally lead us to use our weapons to tear down strongholds that imprison people. In verses 4 and 5 here, Paul says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Listen, close your eyes and listen. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Church, we can have confidence in God and in the weapons that he gives us. And because of that, we can also believe for the breakthroughs that God wants to use us to deliver. Look with me at what Paul says we're fighting against, and the Holy Spirit will give us some insight here. First, Paul says we're fighting strongholds, fighting strongholds. This word in Greek means castles or fortified places. Have you ever tried to share truth? Maybe you've tried to share the Lord with someone or share some spiritual truth with someone and they just didn't get it. We even have an expression right in English that says, I tried, but I just couldn't get through to him. Why is this? It's because spiritually speaking, that person's mind is locked away behind a moat with alligators inside a castle. <laughs> Maybe you know, when you share something that person doesn't like, they unleash the alligators on you. But that person's mind is in a stronghold, a castle. He is trapped in a way of thinking where your message cannot get through to him. His thinking has become the thinking of the religious system or the philosophy that he has absorbed. See, church, when we drink in the wisdom of the world, our minds become spiritually dull and we can no longer grasp the gospel message. This is the result in a human being when the world teaches me how to think. Second, Paul says, we are fighting against arguments. Now, the old King James Bible translated this as imaginations. Some of you remember that. But probably the best way to translate this, <clears throat> excuse me, into modern English is by the word reasonings. Now, me, let me be quick to say, the Bible is not against reason. It's not against you using your mind. But what Paul is talking about there is the way that people reason and use their mind apart from Christ. In Greek, that word is the idea of logic or computation. What a picture the Holy Spirit is giving us there. See, when people don't have the mind of Christ, what they do does not compute. They make bad choices and bad decisions. They do illogical things, things that do not make sense. 
Wouldn't it have been smarter not to start taking that drug? Wouldn't it have been more rational not to gamble away half your paycheck? But you see, people without Christ invent many strange arguments to justify their self-destructive behavior. Without God's wisdom, we make decisions that are based on my short-term benefit and my immediate pleasure. We rationalize our way out of obedience to God's word. And this is the result when my flesh teaches me how to think. Then Paul says, we are fighting every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Now you see Paul sending a little coded message here because the Corinthians uh, valued mystical knowledge that made them feel superior. It wasn't knowledge though that led them into true fellowship with God. And Paul says, we are waging war against every high thing that is keeping people from coming into a true relationship with God through Jesus Christ. People often associate this passage and, and particularly associate these high things with demonic systems. And indeed, it is certainly true that the enemy is hard at work seeking to suppress the gospel. See, in Greek, this phrase, high thing, it means a tower. It means an elevated structure. And the enemy loves to develop idolatrous systems of belief that will cause people to look up to him instead of looking up to Christ. He wants to divert my gaze from the glory of God that Paul says is in the face of Jesus Christ. See, when people give their allegiance to false gods, those demonic powers blind their minds to the good news. We read in the book of Acts, when Paul preached at Ephesus, the Ephesians came out in droves, not to be saved, but they came out and filled a stadium chanting the name of their goddess for two solid hours, screaming out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. This is the result when the enemy teaches me how to think. Church, the world, the flesh, and the devil partner together to imprison men's hearts, making their thinking resistant to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And these are the strongholds that God empowers us to tear down. Worship team, you can come back and help us please if you would. So what should be our plan of attack? How can we overcome the strongholds that imprison people's minds? Just before we close, I want to show you six quick strategies that you can use to help the people that you care about receive breakthrough. Now, don't get nervous because I said six, not two, all right? Our time is getting short, so I'm just going to list them for you quickly. And you can study this more on your own and also study in the New Testament how people prayed for other people, how the apostles prayed for other people. First, first strategy, get your plan of attack from heaven. Get your plan of attack from heaven. When Paul says we are waging war, he actually is using a Greek word that's related to our word strategy. Isn't that interesting? And we need to get a strategy from the Lord as to how to reach somebody. Church, remember that God has plans, but he has no methods. God has plans, but he has no methods. What do I mean? Every person is different. So if you're concerned about your child, first spend some time in prayer and ask God to give you a strategy as to how to reach your child. How many of you know that God knows the way to unlock somebody's heart even if we don't? Second, show love and kindness to that person. Remember what we said, humility and weakness are the foundation of spiritual warfare. Third, pray for God's light to come to them. Back in chapter 4, Paul said that the enemy blinds the mind of those who don't believe so that the light of the gospel won't shine on them. And we sing about this actually when we sing the hymn Amazing Grace. I once was blind, but now I see. Only God can give somebody spiritual sight. So simply ask God to open a person's eyes to the truth. The enemy is blinding them, yes, but God can open their eyes. 
Fourth, I would say, sow seeds of the Word of God. Sow seeds of the Word of God. Don't just debate people, church. Don't just give people your 14 reasons and arguments as to why God exists. Give them Scripture, whether they believe it or not. There is nothing more powerful than the Word of God, and it can reach them. People are born again, the Bible says, by the seed of the Word of God. Five, demonstrate the kingdom of God. Offer to pray for people. When somebody at work or somebody you know on your street is sick or has a problem, why don't we offer to pray for them right on the spot? A few may refuse. A few may say, well, I'm really not comfortable with that. Why don't you go pray for me in your house? A few people may do that, but we have found that most people will not. Most people will receive and respond to a sincere offer of your prayer. Let them be touched by the power of God as he releases his love and his anointing through your hands. And number six, finally, have faith. Have faith that God can change somebody's life. It may not be instantaneous. How many of you know some people are really works in progress? Amen? It may not be instantaneous, but believe God to do it. He wants the best for them even more than you do. Let's trust him to use the powerful weapons of war that he's given us to set people free. Church, God has shown us the foundation for warfare. It's meekness and humility. God has given us weapons. He's commissioned us for war. And God will stand with us and make us victorious in our warfare. So let's trust him to reach the people we love with his love. Let's trust God and be encouraged today in the battle that you face. Because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God. Amen. Come on, let's stand. Give Jesus a hand of praise in his house. Hallelujah.